Well, this morning on, in Jesus' story, the story of the prodigal son, we've all heard it before, I'm sure. First thing I need to tell you, when I read this story many, many years ago, I didn't like it. And that was because I identified myself with the older son. The older son did everything right in his life. He stayed home and worked hard. The return of the younger brother from the far country and the joy of the father sent him into an emotional crisis. And I thought, you know, that's not fair. That's not fair. Because the younger brother wasted his money and his inheritance and everything. And me, being the good, steadfast son, the one who does everything right, why does he get all the glory? Why does he get all the goodies? It reminds me of that TV sitcom, Everybody Loves Raymond. <laughs> if you will recall, Raymond is the younger son, and he's loved especially by his parents, Frank and Marie. While the older son, Robert, the steady son, the responsible son, the police officer son, always gets dumped on and never gets any respect. So I struggled with this. I'm saying, no, but then... Perhaps I was somewhat immature in my faith then. And somehow the joy drops out of the bottom of this story because I'm thinking like, well, what's, well, what's, what's he telling us here? Live a riotous life and then just when we, 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 we finally get our act together, you know, eat, drink, and sleep with Mary and have a wonderful time. Sorry, Mary. <laughs> but I mean, you know, have a wonderful life and all of a sudden God calls us back into the fold. Everything's wonderful again. While the steady son, the good son, the one who has done everything by the book, the righteous son, is the one that doesn't have the big celebration, doesn't have that. So then my question began then is, like, is God a just God? But then I, I started drilling down, looking deeper into this parable. And first, this younger son, this younger son, when he goes to his father and asks for his inheritance, what he is saying in effect is, Dad, I want you dead. I want my inheritance. I want the estate now. I'm not going to wait until you die until the will is divided up. I want the money now. I don't want to wait. And the father complies. So then I start thinking, okay, was this father guilty of poor parenthood? All right, shouldn't he have told his son, no, get back to work in my fields like your brother. Give him a little bit of tough love. However, the father gives in. The father gives him this money to go to a distant land. He heads off to a distant country. And he squanders all the money on dissolute living. That word dissolute is, is, is a polite way of saying that he was living a wild existence. It means lax morals. It means licentious, riotous living. And we don't need to go into details and can imagine what type of life he was living. Then he runs out of money. How do we know he went to a distant country? Here's interesting. Because he's in a place where there are pigs. There are no pigs in Israel. Because Jewish kosher law does not permit pork in that country. So he has no money. Now he's hungry. What does he do? He hires himself out to a pig farmer. Now a number of years ago, my father-in-law and his brother, my uncle, and myself decided that we were going to take and, um, and buy a hog. And we were going to go to a livestock auction and we were going to take and buy that hog and we were going to have it butchered. And then we'd have all kinds of really fresh meat in the freezer. We would have pork shoulder and pork belly, that's bacon, <laughs> pork loin, pork butts, ham, we would have all the good stuff that we needed. And from those sections, the, the butcher would give us sausage and bacon and spare ribs and brisket and pork chops, all of this for the freezer. So we went to the livestock auction, and sure enough, we found we found a hog to, uh, to bid on. Now, there's a difference between a pig and a hog, you probably know that. Pigs usually weigh less than 120 pounds. Anything over 120 pounds, it's a hog. So we bought a beauty for 230 pounds. I mean, it was a big, it was a big, a big one. <laughs> anyway, I think for the total, for the three of us, it came to somewhere around forty some dollars for the, for that that we got at auction. So anyway, we got the we got to the livestock yard to settle up, uh, you know, to pay for this hog, uh, and then of course it'll be trucked off to the butcher. And uh, I was amazed to see the filth of that livestock yard. I mean, I, 
I saw the pig that looked really good there in the, in the livestock auction, but when that, when that hog got back to its surroundings, it was wallowing in its own filth. And I'm talking about pig poop. And it was a mess. And I, and I said, oh, thank God we're eating what's on inside of <laughs> But imagine a Jewish man working in these conditions. And so the father, the, the, the prodigal son, the parable tells us he came to himself. Now some, some preachers may interpret that graciously. He recognized the error of his sins and wanted to improve his life. Yes, that's possible. Some are other more skeptical. They realize he was starving to death. So he decided to get a good speech together, you know, and deliver it to his father. Whether there's grace in that or not, regardless, the father takes off running to him. And this was unknown in ancient Israel. Elders were respected. In order to run off after his son, he needed to hype up his robe, his garment, and basically almost expose himself to run after his son that he saw on a distance. Unheard of! But he sees his son in the distance. And what does he do? He says, get that fatty calf together. Let's have a great party. And of course, the elder son's out working in the field, he hears the music and the dancing, and he gets angry. You know, even all of us in our lives, I think sometimes we, we can appreciate being underappreciated for the work, work, work we do, but somebody else gets all the, all the credit. Everyone knows it's like to be heard. And it would be almost inevitably, in my mind, if I put myself as I did previously, I would be a little bit envious, a little bit jealous of my younger brother. <laughs> but then, my friends, I began to rethink this parable. I began to look at this parable in a different light. I began to look at myself as the self-righteous older brother, the one who pointed fingers at people. And I would say, aha, I believe in my own righteousness, and I would pass judgment on others. And then I came to a time in my life where I realized that passing judgment on others is above my pay scale. Only God can judge. I don't know who's in the kingdom. I don't know who's not in the kingdom. I don't know who is saved and who's not saved. All I know is that God is the God of mercy. And he doesn't ask Gregory who's saved and who's not saved. I'm not the arbiter. I'm not the decider of the kingdom. And so I think when we look at this parable, we're looking at, at the Father representing God, God who is gracious. And we need to identify ourselves with the younger son. Think about that. The 20th century theologian Karl Barth said that each and every one of us must identify with the son. Because each and every one of us are the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter in our faith. We say we love Jesus. But do we really love Jesus? Or have we gone away to a distant country? Have we, left, have we left our first love? Have we really said, oh, okay, yeah, okay, Jesus, I love you. But here, Jesus, think about it. Do we really love him? Do we really give him our all? So we make promises. Oh, yes, God, you know, I'll, I'll come here every Sunday morning. Everything is good. But you know, my friends, worship only lasts an hour. What about the other 167 hours in the week? We lead such busy lives that I think sometimes we forget the beauty and joy of the Christian life that the Father is always calling us home. And yes, we are all prodigal sons. And yes, all prodigal daughters. No, we're not living riotous living. No, we're not taking it and living like the younger son. But we're neglecting our Father, our gracious Heavenly Father who comes to us. I can tell you stories about how much it means to love something so much and how you want to spend so much time with him and that you want to take and be the all of his life. And in my own personal life, I can tell you that when I first met the woman who I would marry over 50 years ago, I spent so much time on the phone with her, probably three hours, four hours, and, 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 as much time as I could. I wanted to get to know everything about her. I wanted to know what she liked, what kind of food did she like, what kind of music did she like. Did she have anything between her ears? You know, she had to be intelligent. She had to be fun to be with. She had to be someone who I wanted to think about spending the rest of my life with. And so I spent all that time getting to know her and getting to know her better. Beginning to love the person that I would eventually marry a few years later. Now, my friends, 
Do I still spend three hours on the phone with Judy? No. I live with her. But the thing is, is that during the course of that time, my love is not diminished. You see, if anything, it's grown more and more. Because our marriage is something that you work on each and every day of your life. And if you love someone, you want to spend more time with them. You want to please them. You want to love them any way possible. And that's what it is with Christ. You want to spend more time with them. And so if you really, really say that you're in love with Jesus Christ, then you're going to start spending time with him. You're going to start spending a lot of time with him. My friends, I can't tell you how much my love has grown. And in June, we will be married for 48 years. My love has even grown more. And in my Christian walk, in my Christian walk, it's the same thing. God is not a distant God. He's that Father who's always calling me. He's calling me to be with him every time, every morning. My quiet time. My quiet time with him. And yes, he speaks to me. Yes, he does. No, not an audible, but he speaks to me through the Holy Spirit. He speaks in my mind. And I spend those wonderful hours with him, knowing more and more about him and the beauty and the glory of his holiness. And that's the joy of my Christian walk. Think about it, as I said two weeks ago, if we're going to be spending an eternity with our Heavenly Father, don't you think you ought to take and learn more about what he likes? Not what music God likes. I don't know what food God likes. But I know he's the God of love. And so it means that we want to spend more and more time with him. And it's such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful feeling to know when you have that intimacy of relationship with him. And you can't even exhaust that time. It's such a joy. And I gotta wish that joy on each and every person to know what it means to taste the Lord Jesus Christ. To know that he's there. That he is wrapping me in his robes of righteousness. That yes, I'm the prodigal son. But then again, I ask you, if God is distant from you, who has left the relationship? If your daily prayer life is stale, who is to blame? Are you reading your Bible daily and having a daily quiet time? If not, why not? And if you say the Bible is boring, then I have to question whether you are reading the same Bible that I am. Perhaps, dear friend, you might be the one who's boring. It's a wonderful story, the God of the Bible. I mean, revealing himself to us in more and more ways. And if we are going to be spending an eternity with him, we want to know more about him. <laughs> In my life, friends, Christ is happening. He's not silent. He speaks to me through the Holy Spirit every day, and I can feel that. And he gives me my marching orders. And yes, he corrects me when I go wrong. But he draws me back each and every time, just like that prodigal son. He draws me back. If you're not thinking the things of Jesus, then you're thinking the things of someone else, and we know who that is the devil, the enemy. It begins, my friends, as I said last week, with repentance. And through repentance, this son went to his father. He began to be on the road to produce those fruits of the Spirit that I spoke about last week. The things that Paul said. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. This is what distinguishes believers from others. And so when we produce those fruits, it means that we are in communion with the Father. But if we're not, hmm. in other words, our works, in a way, demonstrate the fruits, as I said last week, of our righteousness. You know, our Heavenly Father has already killed the fatty calf for us. He killed the fatty calf right there on that cross of Calvary. He celebrated the victory of life over death. What more could we want? Yes, we fear death, of course, but my friends, that fear will be nothing compared to the joy of eternity with our Heavenly Father. Then we're going to celebrate that salvation. And so, friends, the same as with our Christian walk. If you want to get something out of something, you've got to invest time into it. You've got to invest in your Christian life. It's got to be your, it's got to be your very eating, sleeping, and breathing. Yes, we do wander in that foreign country, that foreign country called sin. But a life independent from God is actually a life separate from his love, his fellowship, and yes, his authority. And 
fact, my friends, true independence, true freedom in Christ comes from being with him. I told you before about that bumper sticker that just drives me crazy about God is my co-pilot. Every time I see that bumper sticker, I want to drive up next to the car, honk my horn, wind down the window and say, friend, if you think God is your co-pilot, you better change seats. <laughs> God is the pilot of your life. God permits us to wander. I don't want to be flying the plane of life. I want God to fly it for me. I want to be sitting there on the right hand saying, go to it, God. I'm right with you. But you lead the way. You know what you're doing. This father was filled with compassion. That's why I say it emphasizes that father, that father who ran after. Our God runs after us. He runs after us and calls us back. He calls us back. We got that ring of righteousness on our finger that's accepted back into the family of God. We got his robes of righteousness to wrap ourselves in. And we've already said we got that fatted calf, the blood shed on that cross of Calvary for your sins and mine. So in closing, my friends, I want us to remember that Christ is the only place where we can get a second chance. Our God is the God of second chances. Not only second chances, he's the God of third chances, and fourth chances, and fifth chances. And if I keep on going, I run out of fingers. But God never runs out of his chances for our repentance. We cannot exhaust God's grace. Amen. So I want to encourage you, as we come to church, our church family, to celebrate the joy that we have in Christ. Yes, sometimes we... We, 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 we step out of, you know, and go into that far country that's, that's called sin, as I said. But we're not backsliding truly. Backsliding is when we reject everything that we've learned about the gospel. So if there are friends or family people that you know who have perhaps turned away from Christ, remember that maybe they're just in that distant country and pray that they get called back by the Father. Back, back to that glorious redemption. And so what we know then is we're no longer prodigals when our Heavenly Father runs after us. He runs after us with that redeeming, reconciling love. He wants us to be back in His family again. So celebrate the fact, my dear sisters and brothers, that we are reconciled to a gracious God through His Son, Jesus Christ. The God be the glory in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.